Good evening, good afternoon. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So, uh, we're heading into the new millennium uh, as far as the Detroit history and getting near the end of this portion. Um, so, a little bit of programming note for moving forward. Um, obviously, we have probably one more show. Then we're going to have the, uh-oh, I forgot that. Um, because there's a couple things that I forgot, a couple things I want to add in that I I noticed after. I was like, huh, that should have been here, and then I forgot. Um, but, and then we're going to go into some of the specifics uh, of different things. So, what do we have up tonight? So, we have tonight a couple different things. One is no shortage of corruption this evening. Um, we're going to get into some of the, the leaders, um, that brought apart or brought on the corruption and, and really exposed some of it. Um, obviously Detroit continues to downfall into this, into this specific area. And, um, the other thing that this is going to be is, uh, a lot of athletics, so this is kind of the golden age of sport in the Detroit metro area. We had some really good teams in all four of the major sports. Um, so that's going to be the dominant dominant theme through tonight's uh, tonight's program. So um, yeah, so there's a lot of things going on there. Uh, and then next week will be some of the, the newer programs and projects that are taking place currently um, and, and kind of what's happening in the current scene and current area of doing things. So let's get into it. Maybe. So, like I said, sports early and often year 2000. It's like we uh, saw on the 
tail end of last time, uh, Tiger Stadium closed down officially. Comerica Park is a baseball stadium located in downtown Detroit. It's a beautiful stadium, been there many times. It's the ballpark of the Tigers. Um, and there was a reasonable amount of success in Comerica Park. Uh, it's a really cool venue. It's right downtown. Um, as you can see, you can see the Renaissance Center in the back of the picture. Um, and it is now right by Ford Field, right down from District Detroit. So everything's kind of in a centralized location. Um, beautiful ballpark and always been a lot of fun to go. But we're going to start with uh, some of the construction of the Great Comerica Park. So this is a shorter... Um, it it was built. Uh, naming rights went to Comerica Bank. So, um, but that is the home of the Detroit Tigers now. Uh, and again, just a pretty ballpark. Uh, seems to be seems to serve its purpose and do pretty well. So that's that's the upper decks. There's the there's the risers. Um, so they have the General Motors Fountain at center field. They have the Pepsi Port, which is a bleacher seat. It's all pretty cool. Um, and there's obviously the bridge. You can see the Renaissance Center in the background uh, and kind of downtown Detroit. So it's a really good location. There's been some interesting events there. Um, saw Eminem at. Comerica Park, uh, Kid Rocks played Comerica Park. Like there's been some, there's been some good concerts down there. Obviously the, the Tigers played there as the primary home, but it's a pretty good outdoor skating. So as you can see, that's kind of just what it looked like when it was being built. But yeah, so that is that is Comerica Park, the home of the Detroit Tigers. Uh, as far as population, we're now under a million. Detroit continues to fall and is under the one million mark with 951,270 people inhabiting the city in the year 2000 the census um as we'll see later in today's episode it continues to fall <laughs> and it's probably going to continue to fall uh for the time being um it's uh it was built for much more the the one unique thing is we don't have a mass transit system which i think was some of the some of the reason that that things started to fall um but because we don't, we have, we have motor vehicles. I mean, Ford, General Motors, Chrysler. Um, it was it was designed with those in mind. So those are those are the mass transit system, your own vehicle. So, um, year two thousand, Michigan State University's men's basketball team wins its second national championship. With an 89-76 victory over the University of Florida, um, a young mighty was very happy, Mateen Cleaves. Um, so I'm probably going to get struck for this one, but fuck it, we'll try it anyways. God, it was so much younger then. There you are. You're running for your life. You're a shooting star all the years. No one knows just how hard you works. But now it shows. One shining moment. 
it's all of a lie. One shining moment, they're frozen in time. The time is short, the road is long. In the picking of an eye, all that moment's gone. When it's done, win or lose, you always did your best. Cause inside you knew That one shining moment You reached deep inside One shining moment You knew You were alive With the beat of your heart Feel the wind in your face It's more than they contest It's more than they When it's done, win or lose, you always did your best. Cause inside you knew That one shining moment You reached for the sky One shining moment you knew One shining moment you were willing to try One shining moment you knew One shining moment. Go green, obviously. Uh, probably one of our, probably one of our best, most recent moments. Um, that was the old Flintstone team. Uh, they were nicknamed the Flintstones. Uh, Bell and Peterson uh, Cleves led that team because they were from Flint and went to Michigan State University. So, uh, really cool time to be a Spartan. And I remember it fondly. It was uh, a lot of couches burning in East Lansing that night. Uh, so, then we move on to, and and this was very confusing for me because I have no idea, zero clue, why I could not find footage of the parade. So there was a uh, there was a bunch of events that happened. There was a parade. Um, there was a tall ships parade out on the out on the lake in the river, Detroit River. Um, but that's the tricentennial for the city of Detroit. Um, that happened in 2001, since Detroit was established in 1701. Uh, 300 years Detroit's been a city. 323 years coming up soon. Um, but Detroit celebrates its tricentennial events, include a tall ships on the Detroit River and reenactment of Antoine de la Motte Cadillac's founding of Detroit. In 1701, and in on the dedication of the Underground Railroad Monument. Um, so there was some, there was still some star power. I mean, Stevie Wonder came to Detroit for the celebration. Um, like I said, there were 15 tall ships that went down the Detroit River. Um, and they put nine ships on the Canadian side so that. They could uh, they could see the celebration as well, so ran parallel kind of celebrations. Um, David Allen Greer hosted the homecoming concert. Um, Tim Allen showed back up. Blah blah blah. Uh, Wonder gave a free concert at Comerica. Um, so so it was a big event. I have no idea why I couldn't find any footage whatsoever of it. Um, but yeah, that happened. So um, it's, uh, 
it was very hard to find anything surrounding it at all. But anyways, uh, so it's 300, over 300 years old for the city of Detroit. So really cool. Um, I wish that there was, uh, I wish that there was some footage of it because it would have been cool to, to kind of see and, and relive, but, uh, unfortunate. Yeah, that's, I, I can't believe I couldn't find anything, um, uh, let me see if I just check the tall ships. I remember seeing it like in real life, but uh, I don't remember. All right, I can't find any of it. Yeah, I, I know that they have... Oh, here's... Let me see what this is. This is like home video. So this is from Fort Wayne. It's terrible video, but we can we can check it out and see. There is plenty of the 313 anniversary, just not the the 2001 event for whatever reason, but so this is at Fort Wayne. So this is, uh, like I said, it's not it's not great footage, but it's obviously something that somebody took. That's the ambassador bridge behind. Uh, 313 is the area code for phone numbers in Detroit. Um, so we we celebrate 313 uh, for whatever reason. So that's why. In 23 years, how much better cameras have become. <laughs> There's some Stoll JRs. Linda, I'll try and see. I'll have to, because I have like regular film pictures, um, but I'll see because uh, I remember we visited all of them and they had like a stamp passport book or whatever, because you'd go like walk on them and, and look at the ships. I'll see if I have any of those pictures from when I was a kid. So. Um, but I know I still have them. I just don't know where the hell they're at. So I'll look them up. You're in Discord, right, Linda? I might, I might just pop them in Discord if I can find them, scan them in and throw them in there. But I remember that because it was a big deal to do the passport thing with the book and... Blah, blah, blah. Is there 
cool though. Yeah. Where am I? That's neat. Huh. Just become a teenage beat when this happened. Remember they had all kinds of like reenactments and stuff like that. Um, I don't remember it entirely, but like I said, I know I have pictures somewhere. I just gotta find them. I don't know what this tastes like. This tastes like the cranberry. Like like and it's been a market on for more than thirty years. And I know they still do it from time to time. Um, it's probably every year, nine days before your oldest was born. Um. I know they still do it. I, I don't know when it is. I would imagine it's in, it would have to be in summer. But I know that they still go all the way up um, through the Great Lakes and go up to the Straits of Mackinac and then come back down the other side um, through Lake Michigan. So. That one's cool. That looks very Asian inspired with the sails. And that just signifies some of the importance of, I mean, the, the waterways were obviously critical back then because these were the most grandeur and the most effective ways of, of moving things. Um, so boats were really important during that time. And uh, uh, it's no wonder that they're, they're celebrated. So, yeah, the Venetian blind sails. Um, so, yeah, so it was... Uh, it was supposedly a pretty good event, um, pretty big event, and celebrated 300 years of Detroit's existence. Uh, will we make it to four? Probably not, but uh, here's looking at you, 400. Um, we'll see what we'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, so then we go back to the sports because it was the golden age of sports and. Detroit, Michigan in the 2000s, early 2000s. Um, Ford Field. Uh, Ford Field was built in 2000. Well, it was finished in 2002. Um, and we'll watch some uh, building footage of that as well in a moment here. But they began playing in State Art Ford Field, returning after 27 years in Pontiac. And we watched the 
I think it was last week's episode. We watched them implode the Pontiac Silver Dome, where Jimmy Hoffa is definitely buried. Um, and they moved back into the city of Detroit. So this is right to the side of Comerica Park. So the road that's in the picture, if you look to the left, Comerica Park is right there. So both stadiums are very, very close um, and right next to each other. You might be able to see it in the construction. So, hey, no worries. Um, you might be able to see it, but... mute that music though because that's definitely uh trying to see if i can notice it so it's a big stadium uh it's a it's a decent stadium i'm a football fan i've been to many stadiums across the country yeah you can see the scoreboard for comerica right there um been to many stadiums across the country uh ford field isn't splashy or something crazy like the new sofi and uh in California or um, Allegiant Stadium in and Vegas, but but it serves it serves its purpose. And Ford Field is it's always been a decent stadium. Um, so I was a season ticket holder there for the Detroit Lions for the longest time until they really pissed me off one day. Um, now who knows? I might go back since they're starting to play good football. Uh, But that is the home of the Detroit Lions. And uh, again, many other events. Um, Been to several concerts there. They do all kinds of, uh, like, the uh, Supercross for dirt bikes. They do, um, trying to think of what else they do, the like the monster trucks, that kind of stuff. It's a dome stadium. It's all enclosed. Um, And the Ford Motor Company owns the Detroit Lions. So, of course, they got naming rights to the field as well. I think I saw them replanting Jimmy off on that picture. Maybe. Maybe that's why they can't find them. They took the, they took the footings from the Silverdome and moved them down to Detroit and put them in the, in the Ford field. So. Um, they do kind of, uh, I've been in there for countless events. It's a, it's a pretty good multi-purpose sta- purpose stadium. It gets a lot of use for a lot of different things. So um, pretty good size. Uh, you get good sound and stuff like that. It was built, built fairly well. So um, it just went, underwent a, I think it was a hundred million dollar renovation. To, to upgrade some of the systems and stuff like that recently. Um, but yeah, and it and it didn't cost as much as, again, some of these new monster stadiums have. So it was really quite budget, budget conscious and budget friendly um, as, as stadiums go and new stadium construction goes. And like I said, it shows really no signs of uh, being updated anytime soon. It's a decent stadium, and it 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 does does its job. That's what it needs to do. So, and that's where my seats were, right there in the corner. They replaced the seats in there. Oh, WrestleMania, yeah. In 08 or 09. I thought I have that in here. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, Artificial Turf Stadium. It's, like I said, it's been a, it's been a pretty cool stadium. The terrible old Lions logo. Trying to see if there's anything goalpost, blah blah blah. Oh, 
that's the next one. Oh, stop, stop. Those are different arenas. We don't want those. Um, 2002. Detroit Red Wings win another Stanley Cup. So I take exception to this team, and I'm probably going to get some hate for this from people like Jason or AP if he's here. Um, but this is... Uh, yeah, this was gross. Um, this was the last year and probably some of the reason that the salary cap went into effect in the NHL. Um, and the Red Wings 100% bought their team. Um, bought the best players in the league uh, and and made no... There was no qualms about it. Like, they... They clearly bought their team, bought their championship. Um, and this had people like Luke Robitaille. It still had Iserman. It still had uh, Brett Hull. Um, like, this was a star-studded team. Dominic Kosick was in goal. Um, this was a star-studded team that was bought and paid for. Um, and and they really, uh, they really went all out to pay for this. Uh, the Russian five, there was only Fedorov and Fatisov were the only ones on O2. Um, they broke up shortly thereafter. Um, but yeah, this, this was a bought and paid for team. Um, they, they paid for their championship, which is fine. Do whatever you want. But, uh, yeah, it was, they definitely paid for it. Um, and yeah, that's about, that's about all to say on that. And then we get to good old Kwame. Kwame, one of the... What can you say about Kwame? And we're going to get into Kwame again. Uh, this is just an introduction to Kwame Kilpatrick. Uh, 2002 Kwame Kilpatrick serves as the 72nd mayor of Detroit. So he's the mayor of Detroit from 2002 to 2008. And we'll talk about that later as to why. When we get to 2008. But this was the uh, probably one of the worst moments in Detroit history is when the good old Kwame Kilpatrick got elected to become the 72nd mayor of the great city of Detroit. Yep, we'll get to him more later. 2003. So this was more than just Detroit, but it I, I obviously remember it from the Detroit perspective. Uh, but the 2003 Northeast Midwest blackout. Um, it was a widespread power outage through ports of Northeastern and Midwestern United States and most parts of the Canadian province of Ontario. Uh, beginning Thursday, August 14th, 2003, beginning at just after 4.10 p.m. Eastern. Um, this was this was an insane time, and we're going to look at some news reports and stuff from from the time. But uh, yeah, power was out for for multiple days, uh, and and it was really kind of a big deal. So we'll get into it, and then we'll talk about it. So if you're just joining us, you're uh, watching Local Four. At, I'm Carmen Herlin, along with Devin Scullion, and. We have uh, been trying to piece together what life is like after 4 o'clock here in the Detroit area because we lost power, as did the cities of New York, uh, Toronto, Ottawa, Cleveland, all affected, uh, with, are without power. There are some, uh, some places in the state of Michigan. The entire state has not been affected. Uh, Western Michigan still has, uh, has power, and so does, parts of, uh, or so does parts of Ohio. But right now, the metropolitan Detroit area Very is true. experiencing a, a massive power outage. In fact, both of you who are watching on battery-operated televisions, you're among <laughs> the very fortunate. Uh, if you've got a memory <laughs> for uh, national news, you might think back to 1996, some seven years ago, a uh, power outage that affected uh, nine states across the West. Uh, Commissioner, thanks very much. And again, a great point. On a day when fighting a fire is going to be very difficult, uh, precaution even uh, and prevention uh, even more important than it usually is. You're looking at a live picture of 
Jefferson Avenue downtown, and it is just about at a standstill. And part of this is just normal afternoon traffic. Uh, the border is often jammed around this late hour, the rush hour. But because of the security problems that uh, we mentioned earlier, the computer uh, profiling that has to be done there around the uh, around the tunnel, uh, you're looking at an even bigger problem than usual. And well, of course, this area here that we're seeing now is past the beyond the tunnel as you go past right. the rents in, and it's uh, still jammed. The Grass Point area. Rachel Bianco is uh, has made it her way inside uh, Metro Airport. And what are they telling passengers who are planning to to exit? from uh, Metro Airport today, Rachel. Well, Carmen, right now they're not telling passengers much. They have a lot of questions, as do we. We just arrived here and are still waiting for some sort of official word from a manager here at the airport. But we are hearing that uh, no flights are leaving, but they did allow some to land. There is some power here. Uh, through generators. The lights are running on the uh, runway and the control tower is working. The computers, they have minimal power, but the uh, baggage belt is down, the air conditioning is down, and they only have a minimal computer use and a security system. At least just add up the news anchor. I remember having to carry groceries up to our place because we were there in a tower and uh, had to carry groceries upstairs because the elevators weren't working and air conditioning wasn't working. It was hot. DTE is our local power. No, the airport is affected. It would be a tall order to expect everybody to have power back tonight. Tony Early telling us earlier uh, that there are a number of plants that are damaged. It's going to take a day or two to get parts back to those plants. Let's get back to Emory King uh, at DTE. And Emory, all of that sounded very hopeful. Obviously, from the mayor, it would be terrific to think uh, that all the problems will be solved quickly. However, we know that some people are going to have problems for uh, probably more than just tonight. Exactly, and that was emphasized by Tony Early here at Detroit Edison earlier. We'll show you a building, a picture of the Detroit Edison over here. It's very quiet right now. A couple of reporters out front earlier. <laughs> when we arrived here about 4.45 or so this afternoon, uh, all of the employees were streaming, uh, streaming out. The building had been evacuated. Tony Early's office is on the 24th floor of this building. He said that when we asked him what happened up there when the lights went out, he said, quite simply, it got dark. Uh, but to get back to what you were saying, uh, Devin, uh, Tony came out two times. Uh, was very nice to update us on this. He will come back out again tonight at 9 o'clock. And what he said essentially was that everybody's power is out here. Uh, the good news is that power is available in the state. There are some power sources in Ohio. But it is a matter now, a very deliberate matter, of starting this process of getting the power back on. There are plants in nine locations for Detroit Edison and there are multiple units in each of those locations. Four or five of those units in three of those locations have been damaged, according to Tony Early. They are in the process, uh, obviously, of getting to those units. There are two units up in St. Clair that are up and running. There are two more units, he didn't say where, that are in the pro uh, process of being gotten up and running. However, that doesn't mean that consumers will get power just because those plants are now up and running. They are part of the uh, process of getting all of the power restored to these plants so it can start uh, kicking out some uh, power. As I said, it is a very deliberate process. Tomorrow uh, is anticipated to be one of the hottest days of the summer and one of the uh, highest uh, load days for, D for DTE Energy. Um, a very high load day tomorrow, and so that necessitates 
uh, or people keeping their major appliances turned off, especially air conditioners turned off to avoid what they call rotating blackouts so that DTE will be able to manage the load as the power comes back on. Those of you who have generators, good for you. But those of you, those two or three of you who don't <laughs> or at neighbors' houses uh, watching us on their generators know that. Go home, turn off your air conditioners, turn off your major appliances. And again, Tony Early said that this is going to be a process that will take hours, not minutes, uh, but he wouldn't be pinned down on a specific time. So that is the Northeast blackout of 2003. Um, so a couple things on this. Uh, it was said to be a software glitch or software bug um, that had a 3,500 megawatt power surge um, that went northwest towards Ontario. Um, it happened, it was a couple days here in Detroit. I know that. Um, and it affected about 55 million people. Um, so 45 million in the U S 10 million in Canada. Uh, and it was an absolute mess. Like they said in the news report, it was one of the warmest days that we had. Um, it was about 90 degrees, which is, is, and was pretty hot for, for that period of time. But it definitely, definitely had some kind of impact and duration that, uh, definitely had an effect on us so <laughs> one of the coolest things uh there's a, a quote on the the history of it in areas where power remained off for nightfalls the milky way and orbiting artificial satellites became visible to the naked eye in metropolitan areas where they could not be seen on an ordinary basis due to light pollution so they could actually see the stars which is uh which is not something you get in the city with all the light pollution. Um, but obviously, water systems were down. Cellular service systems were down. Um, power systems. It And it was, it was a lot of people for a very long time. And it was a very impactful event uh, for Southeast Michigan. So, and, and for the affected areas. So. 2003, we have another sister city to add to the list um we've talked about a couple of them before uh this one in china there's toyota japan which is the sister automotive manufacturing in japan uh kitwe zambia uh this established dubai and the united arab emirates uh there's also a city in ukraine Minsk, belarus turin italy and nassau and the Bahama Bahamas that are a current slate of sister cities. I don't know that sister city means anything realistically, but uh, yeah, apparently we have a lot of them now. So uh, I believe that there's similar similar cities or simi similar characteristics or cooperating cities, something like that. But that's hot here. That's hot with the with the lakes and all that stuff. That's really hot. It gets really humid. Well, uh, at 2004, the city of Detroit restored Campus Martius Park. Um, it features an ice skating rink in the winter and is the focal point of the city's new Winter Blast Festival. That was cool for some time. Um, so they change the name to winter fast and winter black like it it tossed around it's not as big of a deal as it once was um but they used to put like a big slide down here like a big ski slide hill type thing um and used to have winter fest downtown and campus marshes campus marshes is still there um in two weeks it will be the site of some of the festivities for the nfl draft that's coming up that i'll be doing some live stuff from down there. Looking forward to that. But Campus Martius is a nice little park, nice little green area in the middle of the city. Um, it's, it's not very big, but it's, it's, it's a nice little place, nice little area. Uh, 2004, going to work Pistons. So last week we saw the... Um, 
We saw the bad boy era Pistons. These are the new going to work Pistons. They beat the Los Angeles Lakers in 2004 to win the NBA championship. Um, this team was just honored by the Detroit Pistons because it's a 20-year anniversary. Uh, you had Rip Hamilton, Rasheed Wallace, Ben Wallace, and I, that's supposed to be Billups, but I put Hamilton twice. Chauncey Billups. Um, and they were called the Blue Collar Going to Work Pistons. So they won an NBA championship for their second. I wonder it was sports heavy. Ah, they're not that bad. Uh, 2004, the newly built Comerica Park hosts the Major League All-Star Game. So the MLB All-Star Game took place in downtown Detroit. Uh, we got a couple of those cool events that we'll see coming up here, the next three. Um, so again, sports was really the the early thousands. I don't know what you call them. The 2000s, the 2010s. Like sports was where that was at showcasing the city, doing all kinds of, you know, different things uh, in in the sports world, winning championships all all around the major sports. Um, Tigers didn't win one, but got to a couple World Series and got pretty close. So uh, it was really what was going on at the time. So it, it captures it pretty well. Uh, Two thousand six, Ford Field in the city of Detroit. Host Super Bowl XL or Super Bowl 40 between the Seattle Seahawks and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, that was a historic game because Jerome Bettis, Steelers running back, uh, he was from Detroit. Uh, he got to win the Super Bowl and retire in Detroit. It, it was really kind of an iconic game. Really good game. I did not go to the Super Bowl. Um, there were plenty of festivities down here for the Super Bowl time frame and definitely took advantage of many of those. Um, still have a terrible towel from from the 06 Super Bowl, which is a little yellow towel that the Steelers used to like wave around like the fans. They'd give you them and blah, blah, blah. Um, it's a cool experience and, and cool to kind of see that in the city. Um, and then, as mentioned earlier, WrestleMania 23. Uh, it was the 23rd annual WrestleMania professional pay-per-view event produced by the World Wrestling Entertainment, held for wrestlers, promotions, Raw, SmackDown, ECW. The event took place on April 1st, April Fool's uh, 2007 at Ford Field in Detroit, Michigan. Why this is important, um, I'm not a wrestling fan. I don't watch a ton of wrestling, but this was the Donald Trump hair versus hair match uh, where he had somebody fight for him, and I forget the guy's name. Uh, where the hell Stingy? Who's the other guy? Jason, you would know. What's that guy's name? Um, shit, I can't remember his name. Uh, this guy. Well, you can't see it, but um, he's the commissioner. He's the guy that's in trouble right now. Um, help me out, Jason. Uh, WWE. Uh, I can't remember his name. It doesn't matter. Um, but so they had a match where one guy fought for trump and the other guy fought for this dude and the loser had to cut their hair off um so obviously we know trump's hair is the brand blah 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 vince mcmahon thank you couldn't think of that for the life of me uh trump and vince, vince mcmahon put up that whoever won the match the the loser had to shave their hair off um there's a lot of uh there's a lot of things with like the conspiracy world and what that meant and kind of uh we're not going to go into that tonight but uh but yeah there was a lot of that and obviously trump didn't lose and wouldn't because he wouldn't ever shave his his beautiful hair off but uh donald trump was here in detroit at ford field for that match 
So, um, and there were several other things that happened there too. Again, not a huge wrestling fan, but it was, it was impactful from what I heard. So then we go to 2008. I told you Kwame would be back. Kwame resigned his office as mayor effective September 19, 2008, after pleading guilty to two counts of obstruction of justice and no contest to one count of assaulting a police officer. Kilpatrick was succeeded in office on an interim basis by City Council President Kenneth Cockrell Jr. So this was uh, this was an interesting this was an interesting time in the city of Detroit because you have and and I believe they did a poll a poll uh, not too long ago, um, and people said they would reelect Kwame Kilpatrick, <laughs> and I think that's the sentiment. I I think there's a kind of divide of of what Kwame was and blah blah blah. There's no question he was corrupt in my mind. Um, he was charged with RICO. He was charged with by the feds he was charged by the state um he stole a bunch of money from detroit he took a bunch of contract money uh, and gave it to friends and cronies um and yeah he was not a he was not a good dude um i remember this very very clearly i was uh he now lives in texas by the way so um I remember very, very clearly. Uh, I was on. I was on. So I got out of town because he was going. They were like perp walking him, but real time, big time. Um, they took him all the way down 94. I think he ended up going to Jackson. But so me and a buddy got out of the city so we could see it. Because after you get out of the city going down 94, um, it was very clear. And I was trying to. Uh, I was trying to see if they had a video of it, but I distinctly remember um, we got out to Belleville, which is a town just west of west of Detroit. Um, and Belleville Road, I remember we got out and walked across the overpass and, and traffic was stopped everywhere. Um, and, and you just saw Kwame driving down the road uh, in, in the police car or whatever, you know. Um, and I just remember that very clearly, but so we'll learn a little bit about Kwame and his stuff. Maybe the maybe the video is in this footage because I remember. Yeah. <laughs> um. So Kwame was Kwame was Kwame. Uh, he he embezzled a lot of money in the city of Detroit and did a lot of damage to Detroit, in my opinion. Um. So we'll. We'll get into a little bit of the history about this. The rise and fall of Kwame Kilpatrick um, from one of our local news stations. Because I feel like this is important because this is this is some of the reason why Detroit's in the in the real dire straits that it was uh, coming into this time because he was the mayor and uh, not that he did anything new. He just got caught, if that makes sense. This kind of stuff was going on since the 80s. Uh, allegedly. So. Kwame Kilpatrick. This is the fight of my life. Preparing for battle. The federal government, the culture of corruption is over. Ready to unleash an explosive case years in the making. Less than a decade ago, he was a rising star in the Democratic Party. I dared mighty things for the citizens of my city. He was the new hope for the Motor City. To rise up! To rise up! And then came scandal. Do you owe him an apology? God, After so many scandal, people love this guy. I for real. Around on my wife. After scandal. We've charged Kwame Kilpatrick with perjury. And it all came crashing down. I lied under oath. But what you saw unfolding in front of the camera might not compare to what unfolds over the next several months. Tonight, Seven takes you deep inside the corruption case. You will hear from the key players. Y'all make me criminal. We uncover exclusive new information. I knew Scott had to come here with something. In the biggest trial this city has ever seen. This is a Seven Action News special report inside the Kilpatrick corruption case. 
Just eight years ago, they were chanting his name at the Democratic National Convention. Tonight, as the 2012 convention is already underway, Kwame Kilpatrick is far removed from the political spotlight. Yeah, instead of preparing speeches, he's preparing for trial on charges that could cost him his freedom. Kwame Kilpatrick, his father Bernard Kilpatrick, his longtime friend Bobby Ferguson, and former Water Department head Victor Mercado will answer accusations that they ran a criminal enterprise right out of the mayor's office. Tonight, our entire 7 Action News investigative team breaks this story down for you. We're going to give you a deeper look at all four men, how they got to this point, where they are now, and what they face in the coming months. But first, we're going to take a closer look at all of the charges. Yeah, this is a complex case, but it's one that fits together like a puzzle. The feds are alleging Kwame Kilpatrick, his good friend Bobby Ferguson, city water director Victor Mercado, and Kilpatrick's father Bernard Kilpatrick, profited millions from a criminal enterprise. Here's how the feds say the complicated puzzle fit together. At the center of much of this is Bobby Ferguson, who owns construction and demolition companies. Feds say contractors doing business with the city of Detroit were coerced to include Ferguson as a subcontractor before, during, and after getting a contract. Many, but not all, gave in. Some of the influence, prosecutors say, came from the top. Kwame Kilpatrick himself, and for Mercado on expensive water and sewer projects. Ferguson got a piece of those projects. Bernard Kilpatrick was allegedly in on the payoffs as a consultant who contractors had to go through to do city business. And he benefited simply as the mayor's daddy. Three nonprofits were allegedly used to funnel some of the money from Ferguson to Kwame Kilpatrick, Bernard Kilpatrick, and the rest of the first family. The feds documented cash, trips, golf, and yoga lessons for Kilpatrick, summer camp for his kids, a crisis manager, and anti-bugging equipment right before he resigned in 2008, and an attempt to buy furniture from the Manoogian Mansion Restoration Society. Kilpatrick told 7 Action News he was shocked when he saw the phrase Kilpatrick Enterprise in the indictment. When I first saw it, I, I, I thought it was absolutely ridiculous and it could not be discussing me. I think it's politically motivated and I think it's something that I got to fight through, but I'm going to fight very hard. I'm very engaged and I'm very tenacious about uh, making sure that the truth gets out there. And that's really how this legal puzzle fits together. But how did Kwame Kilpatrick's career fall apart? Well, investigator Heather Catalo joins us now and Heather has certainly began with a lot of promise. From standing arm in arm with future President Barack Obama to spending months behind bars, Kilpatrick's flame once burned bright, but ended in disgrace with an apology and a promise to return. At the age of just 31, Kwame Kilpatrick defeated popular city council president Gil Hill and became a rising star in the Democratic Party. His potential for Detroit seemed unlimited, and he had many believing the same for the city. Now it's time for all of us to rise up and begin our future right here, right now. He was a mayor who touted himself as the ultimate family man. There's no way I can be a true leader of the city of Detroit if I don't lead in my own house. But just months into his first term, Kilpatrick seemed seduced by the trappings of power. He traveled with rock star style entourages, a security detail more appropriate for a president than a mayor. And news reports exposed Kilpatrick for charging pricey meals and exotic hotel rooms on his city-issued credit card. He was going to stay at very fancy hotels when he went out of town, like the Four Seasons, and r racking up $500 spa visits. But after the 7 Action News investigators exposed the pricey red Lincoln Navigator leased for Kilpatrick's wife for twenty-four grand a year, that became a symbol of excess at a time when he was asking others to tighten their belts. But these are difficult times, and they demand sacrifice. When reporters pressed Kilpatrick on his own excesses, he lost it. Hey, do it. Who is Carmen? The mayor and his staff weren't the only ones playing kill the messenger. Who could forget this anti-media plea his mother made during his second run for mayor? Despite the negative press, Kilpatrick surprised everyone as he inched past Freeman Hendricks to win a second term. <laughs> One story that wouldn't go away and haunted both terms was the fabled Manoogian Mansion party. The never-proven rumor alleged that Kilpatrick's wife assaulted stripper 
Tamara Green. We could never prove it. Couldn't find anything to substantiate it. And the more we looked at it, the more, the bigger the conspiracy required to make it real. Kilpatrick insisted it never happened. I want people to understand that I would never disrespect my God, my wife, or my children. As the scandal swirled, Kilpatrick fled to Washington, where he adamantly told us in an exclusive interview. I don't whore around on my wife, and I don't have wicked new parties uh, at, at my house. He showed similar disdain when asked under oath about an affair with his then chief of staff, Christine Beattie. I, I think it's absurd to assert um, that every woman that works with a man is a whore. Words that would later come back to haunt him. This has been a very difficult time for my wife and my family. On live television, a contrite Kilpatrick wound up apologizing for the affair that had become evident from text messages. But what he did was more than embarrassing. It was a crime. We charged Kwame Kilpatrick only with perjury in a court proceeding. Kilpatrick later came clean and finally cut a deal. I lied under oath. His punishment? A million dollars in restitution, 120 days in jail, and he had to resign from office. On the way out, he made this infamous promise. And I want to tell you, Detroit, that you done set me up for a comeback. The text message scandal cost taxpayers millions, tarnished Detroit's reputation, and left many people angry at Kwame Kilpatrick. What I hear them say, Mr. Kilpatrick, is that you had everything and you could have turned the city around and they feel like you let them down. What do you say to them? They're right. I mean, it's no long answer, but those people are right. Things went from bad to worse for Kilpatrick. He spent 14 months in prison for missing restitution payments and lying to the judge about his assets. Now, if he is convicted in this federal corruption trial that begins tomorrow, how much time is the ex-mayor looking at? Well, potentially for the racketeering charges alone, it's up to 20 years in federal prison, but it is up to the jury. All right, thank you. Now, Kilpatrick did not go down alone. Some family members and close friends were also charged, went to jail, or suffered humiliating defeats. Two were Castec high school buddies who Kilpatrick credits for putting him in office at his first inauguration. They've been there from day one, and they'll be there at the end because what God has put together, <laughs> nothing can break apart. That was Kilpatrick more than 10 so years ago. Gross thanking Christine Beatty and Derek Miller, who ran his campaigns and would become high-ranking aides. Who's just a Democrat ahead of his time? Miller has since been indicted, cut a plea deal, and is expected to testify against Kilpatrick. Beatty has left town. Others who have fallen include his mother, former Congresswoman Carolyn Cheese Kilpatrick, who lost her bid for re-election thanks to her son's scandals. His cousin, Nika Cheeks, was convicted of embezzling money from a fund that was supposed to maintain the mayor's mansion. And longtime friends, brothers Dedan and Candia Milton, played key roles in Kilpatrick's administration, but have since been convicted of taking bribes and are expected to testify against him. Just ahead. Are you really making enough money to, <laughs> to afford all this? An Action News exclusive. I knew Scott had to come in with something. Kwame Kilpatrick's lavish lifestyle. What's the arrangement? Are they helping you out with the car? The investigators on the prowl in Dallas, Texas. Plus. Y'all made me criminal. I wasn't a criminal for them. But his rap sheet says otherwise. Investigator Ross Jones uncovers new information about Bobby Ferguson. And one defendant threatening to expose more information about Kwame Kilpatrick in court. And you can track this case from the beginning on WXYZ.com. We've got a timeline set up. Just click the link on our homepage. I couldn't uh, think of a more perfect person to be my dad. God specially designed him to be my daddy. Kwame Kilpatrick there paying tribute to his father the day he resigned from office. Bernard Kilpatrick played a huge role in his son's rise to power. And the Fed say he cashed in on Kwame Kilpatrick's election. 7 Action News investigator Bill Proctor joins us now. And Bill Bernard Kilpatrick was known for much more than just a lot of flashy style and catchy nicknames. Bernard Kilpatrick often referred to his son Kwame as Michael Corleone, mobster from the movie The Godfather. And if Kwame is Michael Corleone, Bernard's critics say he always wanted to be The Godfather. In the audience for that first historic inaugural speech was proud Papa Bernard Kilpatrick, standing ready to embrace the words of Detroit's new mayor. 
everyone is allowed to participate in the progress and prosperity of this city. So did Bernard Kilpatrick expect to personally prosper? For years, rumors swirled among businessmen to reporters who covered the city about contractors and how they had to go through Bernard's now defunct consulting company, Maestro Associates. We would ask them to come on TV and tell us about it so we could do a story. None of them would do it. They were all afraid of retaliation. Reporters say contractors told them off the record they feared that if they did go public, it would kill any chance of doing business with the city. It was soon after his son took office that Bernard left his job working for Wayne County to start Maestro Associates. Inside Suite 1300 in downtown Detroit's Penobscot building is where Bernard Kilpatrick established the address for Maestro, but we understand he was seldom here doing any business. The feds allege Bernard took in more than $600,000 in cash gifts and private jet trips to exotic places and then failed to pay income taxes on most, if not all of it. Bernard would not talk to 7 Action News for this story, but in a previous interview, he denied charges that he took bribes from contractors. Bribes? How can, I, how can they bribe me? I, I, don't, I'm never, I don't work for the city. I'm a, I, I'm a private businessman, a consultant. But a group of black businessmen, members of AMO, the African-American men's organization, wrote checks to support Kwame's election after Bernard asked them, his fellow members, for help. But they all felt that the young Kilpatrick's election would lead to a better Detroit. Some, like Larry Mongo, say the opposite happened and that Bernard was expecting to do big business with white companies with Kwame in office. Mongo told 7 Action News that Bernard put it rather bluntly. Now that he won, we'll get all the white money we want. So who will the federal government bring to show in their case that Bernard Kilpatrick was a conduit for city bribes? Well, in January of 2009, Bernard told 7 Action News he really wasn't worried about that. Rats coming out the woodpile talking stuff now. The majority of people in this town know that the Kilpatricks have served this community. And what we know now, Carolyn, is that Bernard Kilpatrick eventually closed his consulting business and he lost his condo to foreclosure. Now, undoubtedly, this trial is going to cost a lot of money. So a lot of people want to know who's going to pay for Bernard Kilpatrick's defense. Unfortunately, it appears to be the taxpayers who will foot this bill. Wow, big money. All right, thank you so much, Bill. Stephen? The only one whose defense is not costing the taxpayers is Bobby Ferguson. And this isn't the first time he's faced legal trouble. 7 Action News investigator Ross Jones is here right now. And Ross, Bobby Ferguson has a bit of a reputation for playing rough. He certainly does, Stephen. Bobby Ferguson has said no to lots of requests for interviews, and he's made it hard for reporters to even find him. Well, for this story, he found us. How are you feeling right now going to trial? If you're wondering why Kwame Kilpatrick's been smiling lately, it may well be because of the man to his right. His friend Bobby Ferguson's already gone to war with the feds, and he's still standing. Kilpatrick's hoping to pull off the same feat. The duo have been friends for more than a decade, and starting Thursday, they'll be braving the feds together. For Bobby Ferguson, courtrooms are nothing new. When he was a teenager, he was charged for beating a man in the head with a baseball bat outside a sports bar. DUI and firearm charges litter his lengthy rap sheet. By the time he was only 35, Ferguson had been arrested 12 times. Our transition team worked very diligently, led by Bobby Ferguson and Frank Torrey. That's Kilpatrick at his first inauguration. Right from the start, the new mayor was tapping Ferguson to help demolish more than 5,000 Detroit homes. The feds say Ferguson had unprecedented access to the mayor's office. Even so, in this 2006 deposition, Ferguson was cagey when asked if he and Kilpatrick were friends, dodging even his own lawyer's question. But if you can answer, yes or no, whether you and the mayor are friends. I know the mayor. Ferguson cleaned up on city contracts under Kilpatrick, and text messages show that he, the mayor, and their friend, Chief of Staff Christine Beatty, strategized on how to get Ferguson even more. Why not Bobby in this, Beatty asked Kilpatrick. Bobby wants to strategically lose a major bid, he responded. City contractors complain that the fix was in at City Hall. It was the hottest rumor going, but it was very difficult to pinpoint. Difficult to pinpoint because contractors were afraid to speak publicly. One called me in 2005 saying he'd been awarded excavation work for the city. But at the last minute, he got a call telling him to leave the job site. 
Bobby Ferguson, he was told, would do the job instead. The Fed's first crack at Ferguson ended in a mistrial because of one holdout juror. But he wasn't so lucky years earlier. He pled guilty in 2005 to pistol whipping one of his employees. The attack put Ferguson in jail for 10 months. Pistol whipping Today's an employee. Federal charges carry a much longer sentence this time around. He's hired three high powered criminal lawyers looking to make his record against the feds a perfect two for two. At the end of the day, uh, we're confident that we're going to be able to defend against those allegations and that our client is going to be found not guilty. But if there's anyone he hates more than the government, it's still the media. When we were shooting video outside his office for this story, Ferguson stopped by, demanding to know why we were there. I gave folks jobs and opportunities. I gave them something to believe in. Y'all yeah. took that from me, not me. When you say us, you mean the media? Y'all made me a criminal. I wasn't a criminal before they He left without saying more than just a few words, but he had confidence to spare. Before leaving, he gave me a tap on the cheek, laughed, and walked away. Ferguson is facing 19 criminal charges, and despite his lengthy rap sheet, his lawyers insist he's a good Christian man devoted to his family. And that leaves the man who's considered the wild card in all of this, former Water Department head Victor Mercado. 7 Action News investigator Scott Lewis is here now, and Scott Mercado is threatening to drop some pretty big bombshells in this trial, right? That's what he says in court records, Carolyn. He also portrays himself as an outsider who has not profited a penny from this alleged criminal enterprise. Victor Mercado is the least known of the four defendants and maybe the most interesting from a legal perspective. Feds claim the former Water and Sewer Department director was knee-deep in the pay-to-play scheme, fleecing taxpayers by helping to rig bids on multi-million dollar water and sewer contracts. Some of those contracts went to Kilpatrick's pal, Bobby Ferguson. But here's the rub. The feds don't have any evidence that Mercado ever got a dime in kickbacks. The feds say his motivation was to hang on to his salary, which at its peak was $240,000. Under the powerful federal racketeering statute known as RICO, it doesn't matter whether Mercado profited. All prosecutors have to show is that he was a willing participant in the alleged conspiracy, even if he didn't get any kickbacks. On the other hand, defense attorneys could paint Mercado as an innocent pawn who was just following his boss's orders, hoping jurors will have sympathy for him. In a text message, Bernard Kilpatrick referred to Mercado as the new Hispanic, which could suggest he was not part of the inner circle. All of the big players in the public corruption case, Kilpatrick, his dad, and Bobby Ferguson, were the targets of numerous investigative reporters' news stories long before they were indicted. Mercado was on the media's radar screen, too, but not as much as the others. Were you surprised when Victor Mercado ended up in the group? I'm not sure I was surprised. Victor was always an interesting man to us as well because he pretty much packed up his bags and left overnight during the middle of uh, all these investigations, and we always wondered why. I think we're about to find out why. In these court records, Mercado's defense attorneys paint him as an unwitting victim. They tried unsuccessfully to have him tried separately. They say his supposed role was so small compared to the others, he would be tainted in front of the jury. So how strong is the government's case against Victor Mercado? Until people actually testify, you see the witnesses, you gauge their credibility, you see the exhibits that are admitted, it's very tough to indicate or, or to guess what kind of strength or lack of strength the government might have. Kilpatrick and Ferguson could be worried about what Mercado might say. Both filed motions agreeing that Mercado should have a separate trial. It's the interview you won't see anywhere else. I don't think that's any of uh, the, the city's business. Scott Lewis in Texas with new information on the mayor's lavish lifestyle coming up next. As Kwame Kilpatrick prepares to fight charges of corruption in Detroit, a whole lot of people are wondering, about his lavish lifestyle in Texas, and more importantly, who's paying for it? 7 Action News investigator Scott Lewis traveled to the Lone Star State to get some much-needed answers. I've made the difficult decision, I believe the most difficult decision of my life, to step down as mayor of the city of Detroit. After Kwame Kilpatrick left office, he packed up the family and headed for Grand Prairie, Texas. You know, throughout the turmoil of 2008, not just in the city, but me and my wife, um, we wanted to find a place where we could heal. Kilpatrick says he decided on the Lone Star State after he and his wife sought counseling from Texas preacher T.D. Jakes. Texas is a place where a lot of people come for a new start, and so do we. 
a new start, and some privacy. Kilpatrick can't walk a block in Detroit without a handshake or a shout out. But in Grand Prairie, Texas, few are familiar with the famous ex Detroiter in their midst. His name is Kwame Kilpatrick. Ever heard of him? Never heard of him. Could you take a wild guess what made him famous in Detroit? Baseball? Shoot, I don't know. And what's his name again? Kwame Kilpatrick. I talked to these Texans in the lower income center of town where folks flock here to get five tacos for five bucks on Tuesdays. This is Kilpatrick's side of town, Damn, the outer fringes of Grand Prairie, where new subdivisions have popped up like desert wildflowers after a spring rain. Fashionable homes made of brick and stone and sprawling new schools. Some sections are a bit hoity-toity, and therein lies the controversy for Kilpatrick. When he was in prison, his wife and kids lived in this somewhat modest home, but after his release, the family moved into this 5,000-square-foot house, paying 2600 bucks a month in rent. At the time, Kilpatrick was paying nearly twice as much for cable and Internet as he was paying in restitution to Detroit. Prosecutor Kim Worthy ripped off this letter to the Corrections Department, accusing Kilpatrick of living a lifestyle that exceeded his reported income. She claimed Kilpatrick was, quote, once again hiding assets. Worthy claimed Kilpatrick was spending 2000 more a month than he was taking in. Well, I mean, a full investigation was done of that. It was saying that she was not right. It's been wonderful to work with the state people and not uh, the county. I think a lot of times people do things for political reasons around here. After Worthy's protests, the state did raise Kilpatrick's restitution payment from $160 a month to $500, and he's up to date on his payments. He's also current on his community service, working 16 hours a month here at the Tarrant Community Food Bank. But some still question how Kilpatrick supports his lifestyle. Records he gave to the Corrections Department in 2011 showed sporadic speaking engagements as his main source of income. Are you really making enough money to support all this? Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, I knew Scott had to come in with something. You know, uh, you know, we make enough money to pay the bills, Scott. Uh, you know, just like every family in America, we, we work hard. Uh, we, we work hard to make sure that we can do what we need to do for our children and ourselves. But does he really need this much house? 5,000 square feet, 2,600 bucks a month. Could the Kilpatricks live in the same area with a little less extravagance? I'm a reporter with Channel 7 News in Detroit. I called a local realtor who gave me a list of these four more modest homes in Kilpatrick's neighborhood and the same school district. All four bedrooms from two to 3,000 square feet, leasing for $800 to $1,000 less a month than Kilpatrick's home. That's money that could be going to restitution if Kilpatrick was willing to trim back his lifestyle. At the current rate of $500 a month, it would take nearly 143 years to pay off his debt. And finally, how does Kilpatrick afford two cars? This 2012 Jeep Cherokee with Michigan plates is not in Kilpatrick's name. It's registered to the Shrine of the Black Madonna Church in Detroit. That's something the ex-mayor doesn't want to get into. What's the arrangement? Are they helping you out with the car? Can you tell us? Uh, well, you know, uh, I don't think that's any of uh, the, the city's business. Uh, you know, everything that I do, everybody knows about. And we'll keep it like that, Scott. I mean, uh, I could tell you this, uh, we get a great deal of help from a lot of folks because they know it's a struggle. Well, Scott, Kwame says he's making enough to pay the bill. So what about Carlita Kilpatrick? Is she working at this point, helping out? Well, that's not really clear. At one point, Kilpatrick told corrections officials in an email that his wife was working, but he didn't give any specifics. And I found nothing in his parole file showing an income from Carlita Kilpatrick. And since Kilpatrick limited the time of our interview, I wasn't able to push him as far as I would have liked to on his finances. All right, thanks a lot, Scott. All right, as we've said, this trial is going to be long. It's going to be complicated. Investigator Heather Catala will be in the courtroom for every single minute of that. Now, the feds say Kilpatrick ran a corrupt organization and stole from the taxpayer. Oops. So that is, oh, I guess there's, hang on. They're talking about the clicked it prematurely they have to keep it simple for the jury the feds are going to roll this case out like chapters of a book that will highlight the story of things like the civic fund and the water department deals but the defense says you haven't heard the whole story yet and they feel for example that they can show some of those water department deals were canceled to save the city money not to enrich the mayor and his pals all right thank you heather again as heather points out this will be a long it will be an explosive trial and it all starts tomorrow morning 7 Action News, of course, will be there every single step of the way with minute-by-minute -minute coverage on air and online of this historic event for our region. All right, so that's it. Um, was Kwame racist?
Absolutely. And I think you heard that from the comments. Uh, there's no question with that one. Um, was he a bad dude that profited a great deal off the city of Detroit, not the residents of the city of Detroit? Absolutely. Um, he he really got off kind of scot-free. Um, he ended up getting house arrest in Texas and like you saw the restitution, he won't be done paying it for 150 years. Um, despite all his help and all the people in his corner and all that, blah, blah, blah. Um, so the Kwame Kilpatrick story, you, uh, I mean, he's, he's your quintessential Democrat. <laughs> like, let's not lie about it. That's, it's kind of the MO. Um, Kwame was a bad dude and he was bad for the, bad for the city and did a lot of damage to the city. Um, most of his dealings were just that in the construction, construction like area where favorable contracts and you had to pay him to be able to do business with the city and blah, blah, blah. So call me a bad dude. Um, but like I said, there's, there's, there are many people that would vote for him again today, love him, and doesn't think that anything was was wrong. I'll let you guess. Um, 2008, the Red Wings win it again. So they won another Stanley Cup in 2008. Uh, so this one... Uh, actually, this might have been the... I might have got that backwards. This was the one that they paid for, potentially. I think. I don't remember now. I'd have to look it up, but um, I think this is the one they paid for, because there's Chris Chalios, there's uh, Dominic Kosick. Um, So this might have been the one that they paid for, and the other one was the one that they won the last. So this might have been the one... Um, but same difference. They won two Stanley Cups, um, had very, very good teams in both of them. Um, and that's the last one that they've won since. So um, so after Kwame was ousted, uh, Mayor Dave Bing had a short stint as mayor of Detroit. Uh, he was a businessman. He was a former Detroit Pistons superstar. Um. And then he was reelected after the special election. Uh, he's still he's not there still. Um, relatively short time, but he was the one that replaced Kwame. No, no big complaints on Dave Bing. I don't think he did much. Um, there wasn't much that you could really do, as we'll see as we go a little bit further down here. Um. There was really some issues. <laughs> there were some issues. Uh, 2010, so the population continues to fall. Uh, population city falls to 713,777 as of 2010. Like I said, uh, you continue to you continue to see that number go down more and more and more. As time goes on, I guess time. <laughs> so then we get to this is when so people knew that something was wrong in the city. They knew that things were going wrong and that things were not good per se. Um, and and the next three things really. Really, again, continued to divide some people, and and really, really was is what made us kind of a laughing stock of the world, and and made people have a really bad perception of the city of Detroit. Um, so, uh, Michigan Michigan Governor Rick Schneider, uh, who is a Republican, by the way, not that it matters, but he was a Republican. Uh, declares a financial emergency and appoints emergency manager Kevin Orr for the city. Um, about the same time, Flint was in kind of the same, uh, he was kind of in the same boat. <laughs> so um, 
it was a very unpopular decision for for Governor Snyder to appoint these gentlemen as city managers. Um, but there there comes a time where you have to kind of take corrective action, and and this was definitely it for some of the cities in Michigan. Um, so he was appointed as city manager. Um, and, and again, there's not, there's not a whole lot where I'm like, eh, he didn't, he didn't do a whole lot. And we'll see what his major contribution was in just a second here. Um, and actually we'll, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do this one before or after, but we'll do it now. Um, this is what this is what the city kind of looked like, and it it's gotten a little bit better. Um, but this is kind of what the city looked like when he took over, um, and this is why so many people hate on the city of Detroit. Um, so this is this is what the neighborhoods look like. So many houses just abandoned, burned down. Um, that's the train station. They've since began to rebuild that, but that was around this time. That's looking out on the city. I'm going to turn this down so everybody can hear me. Uh, dentist office in the city. One of the old factories, I assume. inside one of the malls inside one of our theaters just gorgeous architecture and it's sad that it went to waste like that church It reminds me, yeah, it does look like ghost town. It reminds me of, uh, like, you see videos or, or pictures of Chernobyl. That's truly what it reminds me of. There's another uh, church. That's the, that's one of the schools, school buildings. Um, It looks like Chernobyl. It looks like people left in a hurry. And um, it, it's because many of them did. Uh, you had major exoduses after 67 and then. You know, later in history, um, and the shit of it is, some people still lived in <laughs> in some of these places. That's one of the automotive plants. The the previous one. Most of them were gorgeous at, at one time. Yeah. Another another church. Library. Urban decay photography is a is a definite genre here. Um, here's one of the schools. I have some friends that totally lawfully enter these places and take pictures like this, um, because it's just it's so it's so different than what we're used to seeing. Or, or what you expect. I've been in there. Um, I forget what the hell that's called, but it's one of the one of the former theaters. Broken windows, common. That's looking out at the zoo. 
The zoo's to the right. Oh, no, we're not. We're not promoting Ozzy. All right. So, so that's kind of a lay of the land. Uh, what was going on at that point? That's what that's what the city looked like, and it it's sad. Um, no, it doesn't. And there's there's a lot of those places still. Um, maybe I can tag along one of these days and uh, kind of do some video. But it's uh, yeah, that's that's unfortunately common is ish. Um, because the city's just out of money and there's nobody here, so um, there's some stuff that's starting to come back. And part of the reason I left this at 2016 is so we can we can have a positive impact for the last episode. Um, because if it was just this, it would be sad. Um, but in 2013, same year, uh, right after he came into office as a as a city manager to to fix it, um, Detroit goes bankrupt, the largest ever in American history city to go bankrupt. Uh, there was just nothing there. Um, we were already on the decline, and then whatever we did have left, Kwame took with him to Texas. Um, so this is uh, I wanted an outside perspective, not another local. So this is Al Jazeera, but they're reporting on bankruptcy. For the once proud Motor City, it's the ultimate humiliation. That's true. People may so say this is the lowest point in Detroit's history. Um, but if we weren't to do this, the way I view it, De Detroit would continue going downhill. And so isn't it time to say, it's let's stop. Detroit is broke. Detroit's woes began in 1970s and 80s. Layoffs and increased automation slowed the engine of the local economy. Then came white flight, then black flight, the city's population plunged from 1.8 million in the 1950s to 700,000 now. And when you have a population that's that's uh, exiting and you have more people <laughs> collecting benefits than you do coming back to replenish the system, you know, mathematically, it doesn't work. The exodus left four in ten homes empty. The city turned off nearly half of its streetlights and taxes soared, now the highest in the state, but for years, city leaders failed to take on the growing That's debt. I said. We just now an estimated mommy. $18 billion. Uh, I really didn't want to go in this direction. But uh, now that we are here, we have to make the best of it. In March, the state took over, appointing Kevin Orr as emergency manager. Paychecks will be made. Bills will be paid. Nothing changes from the standpoint of the ordinary citizen's perspective. If approved by a federal judge, the bankruptcy will give the city some protection from its creditors. It could mean layoffs, slashing union contracts, and paying creditors pennies on the dollar. In the short term anyway, that is only likely to increase the anguish here in Motor City. Caroline Malone, Al Jazeera. So that was, uh, yeah, um, that was the bankruptcy. Uh, 2014, so just a very short year later, after they got everything kind of squared away, went through the accounting, seen what was necessary, what could go, so on and so forth, back and forth, um, Governor Rick Snyder announced that Detroit had emerged from its bankruptcy, uh, doubt it, um, and he accepted Orr's reg resignation as the city's emergency manor manager but if I can talk, returning Detroit to its elected government. So at the time, taping had real no no real power. Like he just he was there. Um, he didn't really have any power or any understanding of uh, being able to do much of anything um, because of Orr's emergency manager status. So uh, they returned the city back to the elected government. Um. And I think you could say, I mean, that's been a decade now. There, there's definitely been some revitalization. I'll say that being that I've been here kind of through the downturn and then back through the, what seems like it's starting to come back a little bit. 
Um, but there's still a long way to go. We still have a long, long way to go. Um, and I, I don't think anything's going to be handled, taken care of, or, or solved fairly quickly. Um, I think it's going to be a slow process. Um, and then, as an interesting side note, uh, I don't know who this is. Um, I did a little bit of research on him, but uh, 2016 CNU 24, the 24th Congress of New Urbanism is held in Detroit. Congress focused on the city's resurgence and legacy projects. So that takes us through 2016. Like I said, a um, little bit shorter tonight. Very well could have gotten through 2024. Um, I wanted to separate really the shitty, just downtrodden terribleness because I think the city does deserve some credit um, because we are starting to see a rebirth or a re revitalization or rebuild or any of that, uh, whatever whatever word you want to associate with it. And, and I think it's commendable and I think it's something that we need to continue to strive for. Um, continue to work for and and I'm excited to see Detroit become what I think it can be. Um, I think there's still some critical failures and critical errors that they can't get out of their way. Um, the automotive industry is not coming back to save you, so let's let's move on from that, Detroit. Um, but other than that, I think that I think that there's a lot of things that we're doing that are on the right path and. That was part of the reason why I cut it here at 16. Like I said, we, we probably could have gotten through uh, 24 um, and and been perfectly fine. Uh, however, i I wanted to I wanted to give some kind of uh, some kind of credit to what they're doing. Again, I I love the city. I think they I think that they have a fatal flaw in the fatal attachment to the automotive industry here in the city of Detroit. Um, and they're never coming back. But other than that, um, it's, uh, yeah. So next week we'll, we'll, we'll bring up some of the district Detroit, uh, some of the Gilbert investments, uh, you know, that kind of thing and, and kind of the revitalization of the city. Um, yeah, no problem, Linda. Uh, I, I truly do love this city. I, I think still they're making some, some errors, but I got to give them credit for the most part. And I really, truly do have a passion and a deep love for the city. Like it's, it's, it's my home and it always will be. So thanks, Jude. Um, but yeah, that's going to be it for me this evening. I hope you all have a good one and I will catch you on the next one. We'll finish up and get to 2024 next week. So have a good night, everybody. And I will talk to you soon. Take care.